this final event of the term for the Institute for Humanities Research. And the Institute's a platform that supports research and creative engagement with what it means to be human in a constantly changing world. And part of our support for faculty endeavors at our institute is seed grants. And the reason I'm mentioning this is this event this evening emerged through a seed grant awarded to Sally Ball and Julia Nam. And yeah, <laughs> they are exploring the capacity of play between the visual arts and text. And Sally Ball is the director of creative writing at ASU and associate director for Four Way Books. She caref her carefully wrought poems engage with vulnerability, fragility, and the possibilities of what it means to be alive. Julia Nunn, in carefully articulated photographs, opens a dialogue between science and art, ecology, and constructed space, and between bodies and their surrounds. So in their grant uh, thinking between visual art and text, they point out, uh, they they point to a wonderful model in the work of Mark Klett and Rebecca Solnit, who have collaborated on many books, including Drown River, The Death and Rebirth of Glen Canyon on the Colorado, itself a meditation of six decades of human intervention in Glen Canyon, and certainly very poignant today. Mark Klett, of course, is our well-beloved emeritus photography professor at ASU. He makes work that responds to historical images, and he creates projects that explore relationships between time, change, and perception. As for Rebecca Solnit, well, I'll let Sally and Mark introduce her. Um, I'll end in saying this. It is through thinking art and humanities together that we have this event. So thanks to the humanities at the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, the, the Herberger Institute for College of uh, the Herberger Institute for Design in the Liberal Arts, as well as ASU's Faculty Women's Association for co-sponsoring this event tonight, and I'll turn it over to Sally and Mark. Hello, everybody. Thanks for being here. An independent writer since 1988, Rebecca Solnit leads her own bio with that extraordinary fact. 35 years, a life's work and going strong. Solnit is the author of more than 20 books, including Orwell's Roses, Recollections of My Non-Existence, Hope in the Dark, and A Field Guide to Getting Lost. She writes regularly for The Guardian, and she serves on the board of the climate group Oil Change International. She's received Guggenheim and Lannan Foundation Fellowships, the National Book Critics Circle Award, and the 2019 Wyndham Campbell Literature Prize, administered by the Beinecke Library at Yale. Writing in the New York Times, Jenny O'Dell summarizes Solnit's career this way. While Men Explain Things to Me introduced her work to a broader audience, Solnit has long been known for a particular style of prose that refracts history, politics, personal experience, and criticism through a poetic lens. Her writing is marked by wide-ranging yet incisive reflections on time, memory, art, mythology, and the American West. In her introduction to Not Too Late, the book, and more than a book, a project, a movement, and the subject of much of tonight's talk, an undertaking co-founded by digital storyteller and activist Thelma Young Latuna Tabua, in that introduction, Solnit quotes the playwright and former Czech president Václav Havel. Hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something is worth doing no matter how it turns out. She also observes that change happens gradually, then suddenly, a fact that underpins the very plausibility of hope. Rebecca has, in three main projects over 30-some years, also done collaborative, ecologically attuned work with ASU's own Regents Professor of Art, photographer, and geologist, Mark Klett. I'm going to turn this over to him, because I suspect that you know Rebecca's accolades pretty well already, and that you'd really rather hear something that only Mark can say. <laughs> I like Sally's uh, very carefully prepared uh, notes. These are mine here, so I'm going to go. So I'm not going to tell you anything too personal because she's got the goods on me too, so I'm not going to get that far in there. But you may know that she, she has a background in English and in journalism. I think the journalism part's actually very important. You do know that she makes a living as a writer, 
Uh, you may or may not know, oh, I said say she averages about a book a year for 30 years. That's 24? Okay, we'll give you that. Um, you may not know, or you may know too, that she also has a big social media presence. Uh, the last time I looked, which was a couple days ago, she had 219,605 followers on Facebook. And this is like her free freebie there. If you want a public voice on climate advocacy, politics, hope, or just an appreciation of beauty, she's there. Uh, she doesn't do her writing inside all the time, and this is why we got connected, because she loves to camp. And she is a great camp cook. Uh, I love to eat. She loves to cook. It works out really well. Uh, I do the cleaning, which is, you know, fitting. She makes a really fabulous coq au vin, and my favorite, basole. She doesn't need coffee in the morning, she drinks tea. Her favorite is Darjeeling. She doesn't need a lot of caffeine. She doesn't drink much alcohol, but she makes an exception for tequila, especially El Tesoro. <laughs> and ultimately, I think the most important thing I want to say about her is that, um, you know, not everybody can collaborate. You know, we as photographers and writers are often a very kind of singular field. Uh, but she does, and she's a true collaborator in these ways. She honors her collaborative partners and their abilities. She lets the process lead forward with the work. Uh, she maintains an openness to new ideas, and she's willing to risk failure and vulnerability in preference to discovery, which I think is what it takes to be a collaborator. So please welcome Rebecca Solnit. Thank you, Mark. It's true. I had big questions about Edward Moybridge that only Mark could answer. And the best way to get them was to go um, be a camp cook for another expedition of his for a week while we talked at leisure of the campfires and, yes, some El Tesoro. It is so lovely to be here. I'm sort of on book tour. I was at Harvard and Duke, and I prefer the west to the east, and I prefer public education to private. Uh, Sally didn't read. <laughs> <laughs> I was once on a panel with somebody who introduced himself with Harvard and someone who introduced himself with Princeton. So often my bio says Rebecca Solnit is from kindergarten to graduate school, <laughs> a product of the California public education system. I so, Arizona. <laughs> well, you know, I was in California. But, also, but it was also so great. I got to talk to some of you downstairs. I got to talk about feminism. I gossiped about Henry David Thoreau. <laughs> I met some amazing young women treating compost as a powerful metaphor. Um, it was really exciting and lovely and energizing to meet all this great in, sort of creative energy that's what you want a university to be. But I have one question. Why are so many of you walking around with the last name Guest? Is this like a big <laughs> clan or something? Is this like Young in Utah? <laughs> but, um, so sorry, I couldn't resist. So. This was billed with the title of my latest book, which is not just mine. It's a collaboration with my wonderful friend, Thelma Young Lutuna Tabua, whose name, Sally, deserves a medal for actually pronouncing, cold, <laughs> and uh, 20 other contributors. It feels very much like a sequel to my book, Hope in the Dark, but um, you know, it's 20 years since I wrote that essay this month. And it felt like, to, of course, to talk about climate, we need to hear scientists, we need to hear people from the front lines, which in our case, in Selma is based in Fiji, meant a lot of Pacific Islanders, as well as indigenous people, uh, beautiful geographer from Bangladesh, by which I mean her prose style, but it could mean, um, but, and, um, you know, policy analysts, et cetera. And, um, I'm really, really, really focused on climate right now because it's so pressing and it feels like everything else, how we'll live, who will be, what else will live is so subsumed into it. And so, um, you know, and Sally and I started, started talking in 2020. We just felt so 
distressed by all the distress about climate, particularly among young people. We wanted to assuage the fears when the fears could be assuaged by good facts and good frameworks. And so we started a not too late project that turned in, that's a website and social media, and that turned into this book. So, and it's partly because we're nice ladies and we don't want people to suffer, but it's also because we wanted, one of the things that happens when people think it is too late, there's nothing we can do, we don't have the solutions, nobody cares, et cetera, is it makes people inactive. And we also wanted to really try and build an on-ramp to the climate, you know, to engagement in action with climate and um, to try and provide those good facts and frameworks however we could. And, um, you know, because I think it's not only the facts about climate, but in this country, there's so many ways we think about power, think about change, think about the individual versus the collective that render us less powerful, less hopeful, less capable of making the world we need. Um, you know, beliefs that serve capitalism and the status quo very well serve hope and possibility and, you know, the earth very poorly. So, you know, I, and so I thought, so it's also billed as a reading that I might read you um, some of the intro chapter and then um, if there's time, a couple of other things I've written about climate. At, um, so the title essay is called Difficult is Not Impossible because and that felt like a really important distinction to make. And um, because there really is a sense often where people, People do say regularly that something's impossible that's just very hard. And had we started doing what the climate required of us when we first started talking publicly about it in a big way in the late 80s or 90s, we would have had to have like a curve of change going, just sort of a gradual change. But, you know, it's 30 plus years later and we need, a, we need radical change fast. But it's not impossible. The obstacles are political and not... You know, we know what to do, we know how to do it. A lot of it has already been done. Um, but we need, you know, we need to end the age of fossil fuel and do that fast. And so, so I wrote, it is late, we are deep in an emergency, but it is not too late because the emergency is not over. The outcome is not decided. We are deciding it now. The longer we wait to act, the more limited the options, but scientists tell us there are good options and great urgency to take them while we can. An emergency is when a stable situation destabilizes, when the house catches fire or the dam breaks or institution implodes, when the failure or sudden change or crisis calls for urgent response. It's when it becomes clear that the way things were is not how they're going to be. Some days it can feel like you yourself are the, uh, the house that caught fire, but you might also turn out to be the firefighter or the water. You might even become the other interpretation come along to say that some structures should be burned to the ground because they were prisons or miseries. An emergency can involve terrible loss. It can bring about magnificent transformation. And while it's uh, unfolding, the outcome can be impossible to foresee or it can depend on what you and we do. The word itself comes from emerge, to exit, to leave behind, to separate yourself from. So an emergency is when you exit from the familiar and the stable. We're now doing that on a planetary scale, exiting the stability and reliability of the delicately tuned systems of seasons, weather, relations between species, even the shape of the world for the past 10,000 years. As oceans draw new coastlines, lakes dry up, glaciers melt, and natural and human communities shift and migrate. It's an exodus into the unknown, and our task is to make a home there for ourselves and for the nature from which we were never separate. We are deep in an emergency and we need as many people as possible to do what they can to work toward the best case scenarios and ward off the worst. Involvement depends on two beliefs. One of them arises from having a sense of personal power, that you have the capacity to have an impact, that what you do matters, that you matter. Inseparable from that is the hope that it matters that you do it. And many in desperate circumstances have believed it matters, even when they didn't believe they could win.
and sometimes they won anyway, or they inspired somebody else to win. A lot of stories in circulation endeavor to rob you of hope and power, to tell you it doesn't matter, or it's too late, or there's nothing you can do, or we never win. Not Too Late is a project to try to return hope and power through both facts and frameworks. 20 years ago, I began to speak directly about hope and to what impeded it for so many people. I wrote, I say all this to you because hope is not like a lottery ticket. You can sit on the sofa and clutch feeling lucky. I say this because hope is an ax you break down doors with in an emergency. I wrote during a surge of neoliberal attacks on indigenous people, nature, small farmers and labor, and the so-called global war on terror of the oil-fueled climate-denying Bush administration that killed millions and demonized billions. People pushed back, and there were victories, and they mattered. There was virtually no climate movement to speak of then, though there were campaigns against the coal, coal and oil industry and their environmental destruction and human rights violations. The world is now both better and worse than we imagined 20 years ago, and it's just unimaginable from even 20 years ago, let alone 50 years ago. Something I say is we cannot imagine the world of 2073, but we can build it anyway. Just as 2023 was absolutely unimaginable in, I just saw a cousin of mine in the front row. Never. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, name tags. Oops. <laughs> Speaking of unimaginable things, we only met as adults. But um, what was I going to say that, um, you know, the world of 2023 is absolutely inconceivable from 1973 in terms of how we think about gender, about race, about the environment, in terms of terrible things, the new authoritarianism, the um, new enthusiasm for Nazis. Um, in many places, but it is just unimaginable. And so I feel, And but the best things in the moment we're in were being made then, were being made by, you know, the gay and lesbian rights movements, by a relatively new feminist movement that was still trying to find language to talk about things like sexual harassment that 50 years ago had just won reproductive rights as abortion rights. You know, the, the people thought the um, civil rights movement was slowing down, and the black civil rights movement probably was, but indigenous and Asian and Latino movements were gathering force. And the environmental movement was really coming out of the conservation movement as something much more radical and integrated and possible. And it was really new in so many ways, too. I'm, you know, I, Silent Spring was a little over a decade old, and um, 1973, and when it came out, people didn't think about downwind and downstream and et cetera. So we're making a world we cannot imagine, and that's completely normal, and difficult is not impossible. So, and uh, and that was a free free floating digression. I'll just pick up again here, <laughs> <laughs> and also blame uh, blame relatives of mine. It, um, as a, which is something you know we all should do early and often, and I'm sure all of you have already mastered. That uh, I'm not sure if it's an undergraduate or an upper division class, or so. But hope is not optimism. Optimism assumes the best, and assumes its inevitability, which leads to passivity, just as a pessimism and cynicism that assumes the worst does. Hope, like love, means taking risks and being vulnerable to the effects of loss. It means recognizing the uncertainty of the future and making a commitment to try to participate in shaping it. It means facing difficulties and accepting uncertainty. To hope is to recognize that you can protect some of what you love, even while grieving what you cannot. To know we must act without knowing the outcome of those actions. Over and over, the world has been changed by people who were at the outset seemed far too puny to pit themselves against the most powerful institutions of their time, genocide against indigenous people, who in the late 20th and early 21st centuries have reclaimed culture, rights, language, and land, and become key leaders for a changing world. Such power from below has changed colonialism worldwide, ended slavery in the British Empire in the 19th 
and the United States in the 19th century, toppled authoritarian regimes in the 20th century, broadened the array of rights for so many of us in so many ways, changed the conversations, and reminded us again and again that ideas are incredibly powerful, and which is why the work of universities, the humanities, the liberal arts, the arts are so powerful even when people don't want to fund them, don't take them seriously, tell you that you should be a business major. It, um, to hope, nothing against business majors, but we need, we need artists. To hope is to accept despair as an emotion, but not an analysis, to recognize that what is unlikely is possible, just as what is likely is not inevitable, to understand that difficult is not the same as impossible, to plan and to accept that the unexpected often disrupts plans for the better and the worse, to know that the powerful have their weaknesses, and we who are supposed to be weak have great power together, power to change the world we have before and will again, to know that the future will be what we make of it in the present, to know that joy can appear in the midst of crisis and that even a crisis is a crossroads. Meteorologist and climate journalist Eric Holthouse writes, in a climate emergency, courage is not just a choice, it's strategic, it's a survival strategy. And which reminds me, another writer friend of mine, Michael Sims, a Thoreau scholar among other things, told me a few years ago that the word encourage literally means to instill courage. It's thought of as a kind of peppy sweet thing, but I think it can be tougher than that. And I think everyone needs encouragement. And it's strangely for somebody who is so not a cheerleader, turned into the job that I've done a lot since I wrote Hope in the Dark and realized that how, how much encourages despair and defeatism in this culture, how much people need to be told the other versions of what's possible and who we are and what we've done in the past that can be a template for what we can do in the future. So. And Holthouse continues, perhaps hope is the courage to persevere when winning looks hard. Perhaps it's not hope but faith that sustains people when it looks almost inconceivable. Vaclav Havel, um, who was a catalyst for revolution and regime change in Czechoslovakia in the 1970s and 1980s, speaks of it in another way. He says, as Sally quoted, hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something is worth doing no matter how it turns out. I actually had a couple people ask me a few weeks ago, like, why should they do anything when they didn't know the outcome, talking about climate action and politics, and I was kind of dumbfounded. And there, If we only did things we knew the outcome of, there would be no children, no dating, no sports, um, <laughs> no elections. I, I don't know. I don't know if we would ever do anything, <laughs> but uh, you know. But it is this thing. Americans are so uncomfortable with uncertainty, which is the reality of what the future is, and we stuff it full of false certainties. And true uncertain. It's much smarter to know you don't know what will happen than to pretend that you do. But the, both the optimism and pessimism that I think are the real enemies of hope. Pretend they know what will happen. Optimism that everything will be fine and therefore nothing is required. Pessimism that everything's going to hell and that nothing is required. And um, everything is required because we're making the future in the present. I know our parameters with climate, you know, we're not going to make it as though it never happened. But the best case scenario is so profoundly different than the worst case scenario. And we are deciding it in this decade with what we do or fail to do. So, at, um, sometimes victory looks like the thing that didn't happen and leaves nothing to see. The trees that weren't cut down or the drilling permits that weren't issued. We need more, but we also need to recognize the victories and achievements behind us and those in the past because they tell us that we have won, we can win, and thereby equip us to keep trying. Remind us how often winning is indirect, unpredictable, slow, how difficult it can be, how imperfect a victory can be, and never less be a victory. And, um, you know, the future is unknowable. The past gives us beautiful templates for doing what we need to do anyway. And um, so there's all this practical stuff in this introduction. I think I'll skip some of it. <laughs> but, um, because the book is available downstairs, and a bunch of you already got it. And um, 
you know, although I could talk about, I don't know, I find the practical stuff like the renewables revolution that's truly made it possible as nobody foresaw in the year 2000 to leave the age of fossil fuel behind. I find it astounding that we did not really have an alternative to fossil fuels then. In the 70s, people could only see nuclear as an alternative. Even in 2000 and into the early parts of this millennium, uh, wind and solar were crude, expensive, utterly inadequate technologies. And what fascinates me about the revolution is that it was too slow for most people to see. I Apparently caring about climate, at least in my case, means looking at graphs a hell of a lot more than, you know, humanities, arts people normally look at graphs. They're kind of like sciencey things. And um, there's so many graphs about like how the price of solar has dropped or the implementation of wind has gone up. But they're usually short-term frameworks. And they don't really give you the full picture of how radical it is that Iowa gets 60% of its electricity from wind because it's the cheapest west cheapest, best way to produce electricity there, that Texas, which does not particularly love renewables and doesn't, you know, officially gives, doesn't give a fuck about climate change, gets more energy from renewables than it does from coal just because they're better. And according to a lot of the best people out there, like Mark Jacobson, the engineer at Stanford, we could pretty much electrify almost everything and do it fast if we can overcome the political obstacles. So it's a revolution. And one of the things that fascinates me, again, about understanding change is it often happens too slowly to perceive. I know, not that long ago, people would tell me feminism had failed. And it'd be like, yeah, you know, if you talk about 2022, not a great year for women in the United States. Although in the last few years, women in Mexico, Argentina, and Spain all got abortion rights. So if you enlarge the lens, it looks good. But if you take a big chunk of time, I'm 61, if you look at the status of women when I was born, which is just, I think for a lot of younger people, almost inconceivable how unequal we were, how marriage was essentially a sort of master and servant relationship under the law and in culture, how women lost so many rights in marriage, how, you know, how the Ivy Leagues didn't admit women, how so many kinds of discrimination were legal, how the law didn't address sexual harassment, most domestic violence, most rape, et cetera. I met a woman not that long ago whose mother was one of the first women in Texas to serve on a jury, which meant that women had to go before all male juries. Um, you know, what, there were no women, it would be a long time before there'd be a woman on the Supreme Court. Etc. So the bigger time frames let you see change. I wrote an essay for The Guardian, the main place where I write a few years ago, where I said, I'm a tortoise at a mayfly party. <laughs> you know, then I did my homework, because um, I'm a very sciencey um, arts and humanities person, and the larval forms of mayflowers actually live a long time, but <laughs> the, you know, then they turn into the mature form, which lives for a day. Tortoises live 150 years or more at times. And I feel, this, so I'm really interested in kind of the long view and what happens when you see how something has changed. And sometimes it's about being older. And I'm not really old enough to remember on practical terms that to be queer was to be treated as mentally ill or criminal or both, you know, well into the 1970s and beyond. But I think you can even be really young and be historically minded and know how different things were. And that's what that, you know, actually my collaborator, Mark Klett, has this wonderful phrase I call on a lot, change is the measure of time. I think sometimes you have to be slower than change to see it. You know, we're historically minded. And, um, but, and that if you ha take really short time frames, you believe the world is stable and unchanging. And that can lead to its own kind of despair. So with that, I'm going to read a Guardian piece I wrote. Um, for the fucking New York Times that then turned it down, but then The Guardian published it. <laughs> Working with The New York Times is a nightmare, by the way. Working with The Guardian is a dream. It, um, you know, and they don't try and censor your politics, for one thing. And um, so um, it's called A Truce with the Trees. So, and it's interesting, because I, I, I write about a whole spectrum of things I also read in a spectrum of styles. I was trained, as Mark mentioned, as a journalist, and I love the sense of resourcefulness and integrity that came with it. But I've, I read a lot of poetry, and I want sometimes to describe the world in ways that journalism doesn't, to find 
the connections and relationships that are more intuitive than linear and objective and things. And so there's a broad spectrum of kind of how I write to and so this piece a little more than is a little more lyrical, I think, than a lot of the introduction. A truce with the trees. For the last fifty years, David Harrington, the founder and artistic director of San Francisco's Kronos Quartet, has been playing what he calls pretty athletic music on a violin made in 1721. On it, I've heard him play all kinds of compositions from the galloping notes of Orange Blossom Special to the minimalism of Terry Riley and even the occasional bit of Bach. The instrument made by Carlo Testori in Milan has survived three centuries, has in David's hands alone made music for countless audiences and can be heard on more than 60 Kronos Quartet CDs, mostly recordings of work by living composers from around the world. When I first learned the age of the instrument, I was filled with wonder that a delicate piece of craftsmanship could endure for centuries, that something so small and light could do so much, that an instrument made in the 18th century could have so much to say in the 21st. It felt like a messenger from the past and an emblem of the possible, a relic and a promise. This violin is from before, before the Industrial Revolution, before James Watt made the steam engine a voracious, ubiquitous device, devouring coal and wood and then oil, driving mills, looms, pumps, then locomotives and steamboat engines, before we began gouging out of the earth so frantically to feed those steam engines and then those internal combustion engines before we dug out so much of the carbon that plants had so beautifully sequestered deep in the earth eons ago, before human impact exploded into a destructive force with the power to change the acidity of the oceans and the contents of the atmosphere, before the steady levels of CO2 in the atmosphere from about 270 or 280 parts per million to where we are now at about 420 parts per million. The sheer thrift of an instrument lasting so long said to me that maybe you could have magnificent culture with material modesty, that the world before all of our fossil fuel extraction and burning could be plenty elegant, and maybe the world we need to make in response to climate change can feel like one of abundance and not austerity. For a long time, we've narrated what the response to climate change needs to be as austerity and renunciation and sacrifice. But fossil fuels have been poisonous both literally and politically, renouncing them in an age when renewables have become adequate substitutes for most of what they've done means giving up something that has contaminated our world and impoverished our confidence in the future. We tend to think of abundance as material stuff but perhaps our piles of loot overshadow less tangible things that also matter, including continuity with the past, confidence with the future, and the cultural richness that is not just a commodity. David's violin is clearly a working instrument, a little battered with a worn finish, a lot of tiny nicks or dings, and a visible crack. Its materials are themselves a sort of global gathering, all of them organic, None of them the original, none of the original ones involving mining, though metal tools would have been crucial to making the instrument. A violin is usually made out of spruce wood on the front or belly and maple on the back, sides, and neck. Traditionally, a violin's fingerboard and tailpiece were made of ebony from South Asia or Africa, though because it's an endangered tree, instrument makers mostly use other wood now outside China. The glue that holds the instrument together would have been made from boiling animal hides, and the varnish might have included shellac made from a secretion of the lac insect in South Asia, or just pine sap and some kind of vegetable oil, often linseed oil from flax. The strings were once made of sheep gut, not cat gut, popular though the term is, though these days tend to be metal and synthetic materials. Rosin made from tree resin allows the bow to sound on the strings. Without it, David notes, the instrument would be silent. When I was a very unpromising child violinist, the clear amber lump of rosin was one of my favorite things about the instrument. Nearly all bows are still strung with horsehair because mares tend to 
urinate on their tails. The ideal material is the white hair of the tail of a stallion or gelding, usually from Siberia, Mongolia, Canada, or Argentina. A few years ago, a bow maker told David that because of climate change, it was harder to get the strong horsehair cold climate produces. Violin bows were for century made by preference from permambuco wood from Brazil's Atlantic forests, specifically from the heartwood, the dense rings of orange-brown wood at the center of the tree. These trees are likewise endangered and avoided by many instrument makers now. Bow makers and violin makers have joined conservationists to form the International Permanbuco Conservation Initiative to protect and regenerate the species and the forests in which they grow. That tree is also known as Brazil wood, um, from which the um, country of Brazil gets its name. One bow could bring together the Arctic and the tropics with the, with the horsehair and the Brazil wood. And if it was inset with ivory, abalone, or mother of pearl, as many are, also incorporate materials from the ocean or yet another continent. A violin with ebony, ivory, and a permambuco bow is a relic of the colonialism in which Europe enriched itself with materials from other continents. But it's also an all-renewable materials artifact. Mostly, a violin is trees. The spruce and maple with which violins are made also face impacts from climate change. You can see the spruce rings on the front of David's violin as a series of fa fairly even lines of growth. But erratic weather produces erratic wings, um, ring, erratic rings, and the spruces used for Italian violins grew in the Dolomites, and the climate there is shifting. In those mountains is a famous forest known as the Forest of Violins because so many instruments were made for so long with its wood. As the climate changes, this place may cease to be an ideal source of wood for instruments, and increasingly erratic weather may worldwide may make consistent wood grain harder to come by too. Luthier Nathan Weiss says woods used by Stradivarius and his peers had a climate element to them. Decades of colder temperatures in Italy, Switzerland, and Germany led to slower growth of the spruce trees. In particular, the words used in Cremonese violins are believed to have superior tonal expressiveness and projection thanks to the density, i.e. the tightness of the tree rings, of the cold-grown spruce trees. It's the wood's vibrational efficacy and the effective production of sounds that distinguish this rare and highly valued family of violins from others. According to a report in Nature Climate Change, Norway spruces in Central Europe now grow a third to three quarters faster than they once did. Perhaps there will be Anthropocene instruments with the, their own sounds from trees whose voices have changed with the climate. My friend Hans Johansson, a violin maker in Iceland, is grounded in the great tradition, but facing the future with interest rather than fear. I'm not afraid of things changing, and I don't think magic is going to disappear, he told me a few years ago. Based in Reykjavik, he brews his own hide glue and varnishes and makes instruments with hand tools, much as Stradivarian Testori would have. His instruments are played in orchestras and quartets around the world, but he's also made experimental instruments and tested new materials. Though computers can help, the craft still relies on the ear as well as the hand. Hans notes that one of the reasons for the difficulty of mass producing violins is the fact that the wood never has the same properties. Even pieces of spruce or maple from the same tree. When the flitches of wood are held and struck with a blow of the fist, some pieces are found to vibrate loudly with a long ringing tone, whereas other pieces sound dull and the note dies away quickly. It's conceivable that the cellos and violins he's made will be played as long as the Testori violin Harrington played has been, that in the year 2322, someone will be play, playing a Johansson instrument from Reykjavik. The wood in David's, and I think imagining the deep future is really interesting. I did a related talk a while ago. I, you know, I live in the Bay Area, so Muir Woods is well known. The oldest tree there is 1,300 years old. But if you planted a redwood tree, and you know, it's not that hard to think about, you know, the year 700 AD. But if you planted a redwood tree tomorrow and it lived as long, we'd be thinking about, now you watch the English major do math. <laughs> Is that the year 3500? It, um, 
you know, and thinking about that, I think is so interesting in an era where we're making decisions that will impact, will decide what the world will look like for thousands of years. One of my friends um, is an Icelandic writer, um, Andre Snare Magnusson, who tried to help us think in deep time by thinking about the people his grandparents had known as children, and then the people his children might meet as old people to help us extend into the future as we rarely do the way we extend into the past more often. And the violin did this for me in a wonderful way. It's just kind of so exciting to see something that had lasted 300 years and it's got such an antithesis of disposable culture. So, the wood in David's violin would have aged for several years before Carlo Testori began to use it and would have come from mature trees that were growing in the 17th century and maybe some portion of the 16th. The trees were likely contemporaries of Galileo, Pocahontas, Cervantes. Like all plants, all forests, the trees from which the Testori violin was made had been pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and sequestering it in their wood and in the earth. The fossil fuel we burn now is an end product of carbon sequestered by plants eons ago. And the violin is a tiny carbon sink, a reserve of carbon that didn't go back into the air, but stayed here and sang. I often think of what we're doing with our frenetic burning of fossil fuels as a sort of war against the trees. We've put ourselves at odds with them at when we've started a war against them, as the forest fires so common in my state demonstrate. It's, this burning is how we put back in the atmosphere the carbon they pulled out of it and continue to pull out of it. Forests across the earth are said to sequester about two-fifths of the carbon we put into atmosphere annually. They're doing an amazing thing for us, but we're giving them more work than they can possibly do while we cut them down and create the conditions that burn them down. The other three members of Kronos Quartet also play instruments that hail from other eras. John Sherba's violin was made in New York in 1884 when atmospheric carbon was at 293 parts per million, only 16 parts higher than in 1721 when David's violin was made. John's violin was crafted the year before Oscar Benz in Germany made the first petroleum-powered automobile. Sonny Yang's cello was made in Italy in 1903 when the reading was 296 parts per million, the same year the first Model A Ford was sold and the Wright brothers flew the world's first successful heavier-than-air airplane, the year both George Orwell and Roy Acuff were born. I had to put Roy A. Cuff in there because David loves Orange Blossom Special. And uh, Hank Dutt's viola was made in Italy in 1913, three years before we crossed the threshold of 300 parts per million, the year the Model T became the first truly mass-produced automobile. These instruments come from a world in which petroleum-based plastic did not exist, the great tropical forests were largely intact, and the seasonal cycles had not been disrupted but also from a world in which Africa was largely ruled by European powers and many human rights had hardly been conceived of, yet alone realized anywhere on earth. The past tells many stories and always one story, that change is constant for the better, for the worse. One evening, not long ago, I went to see the San Francisco Symphony's annual concert with the Oakland Interfaith Gospel Choir. The symphony musicians sat in a semicircle that began with vi violins and violas and ended with cellos and basses. And thanks to the time I'd spent contemplating David's violin, I saw it as a forest of wooden instruments. The gospel, gospel singers stood above them, and at one moment, when I could see dozens of bows moving in unison in the dimness, see half a hundred mouths open in song, it felt like some truce between our species and the trees had been struck. Maybe that's the promise David's violin seemed to hold when I discovered how long it had been singing. At my request, he brought it over to my apartment and took it out of his case. I was a bit overawed and ready to spread a clean cloth to lay it on, but he put it on my table without any fuss and let me pick it up. It felt like a bird when I held it, almost weightless, incredibly powerful, and extremely delicate. And then I saw Kronos perform one more time, and there it was in David's hands. 
making music as it had for three centuries, seemingly strong enough to go on indefinitely. Thank you. Uh, so uh, Rebecca is generous enough to uh, take a few questions. So and we have um, we have a little bit of time, maybe ten minutes or so. I should just say, trying to convince people that in many ways we live in an era of austerity and renunciation, um, thanks to fossil fuel and so many other terrible things, and that we could make an era of more abundance, not necessarily of material things per se, but of clean air, clean water, hope for the future, time for friendship and connectedness, um, a happy relationship with the natural world, which I think makes a lot of people look feel guilty or anxious to pay attention to, and, um, and which for me is really about changing the story that's so often told of like, oh, you should be reluctant. They all want to like take away your hamburgers and your, your hummers. And, um, and now we live in this wonderful era and that what will come if that you let them have their way, it will be worse. So I've keep trying, and it's also interesting, I think we all keep trying to find different ways to tell the story of what people think they know but need to keep paying attention to. What are the ways you can tell a climate, a story about climate that's new? And David's very old violin felt like such an invitation to do so. It was such an enchantment for me to just explore it and the materials and the meanings it could stir up. So, and I'm very happy to take questions. Yeah. Should I repeat the question? Yeah, she's uh, participated in Third Act's um, March 21st action against the four big banks, um, Citigroup, uh, Chase, Wells Fargo, and Bank of America, um, financing fossil fuel extraction in this country. And um, she asked me, what are the good stories about divestment? Because it was a move your money day where if you had accounts of any or credit cards with those banks, you were encouraged to pull them out. I think the fascinating thing about the divestment movement is I was there when it started. It started part, you know, and people were like, oh, this won't work. It doesn't matter. It doesn't signify. And it's partly that people wanted to tell a story about direct consequences, like do you take your money out of Wells Fargo and then they say I'm sorry and like do what you tell them to the next day, which is a kind of sad American instant results guaranteed or your money back way of thinking about change. One thing is the, the divestment movement globally has gotten more than $41 trillion withdrawn from fossil fuels in pension funds, university funds, um, you know, uh, religious institution funds, and uh, you know, mutual funds and a lot of other things. And so that's had a real impact. And the fossil fuel industry knows that um, we're after them and they are very concerned. Uh, often your enemies estimate you even when your friends tell you you're not doing much. But the other thing is what that also did is it educated people about how um, complicit we can be in this and how we can change that complicity. And it really kind of delegitimized and, and demonized, deservedly, the fossil fuel industry. It was part of educating people about what they do and that we have power to do something about it. One of the things I'm right about and not too late and that I'm so committed to is indirect consequences. People really want either instant results or direct results. And often you do something and the effect will be profound, but it won't be predictable and direct. You know, you say, let's not build a pipeline, and it becomes a way to build alliances, educate people, as the KXL pipeline which um, movement was, which successfully stopped you know, a huge pipeline coming out of Canada to refineries in the, the U.S. And the standing, the attempt to stop the Dakota Access Pipeline uh, across the Lakota na a nation of Standing Rock was less, you know, they didn't succeed in stopping the pipeline, but 
did so much else. And so I'm also a huge fan of indirect consequences. Among the things that Standing Rock, incredible wave of action in 2016 did is it brought together probably the greatest gathering of native people in North America, maybe ever created kind of rebuilt relationships between um, Lakota groups, between the Lakota and the Crow. Um, hundreds of US Army veterans came to apologize for what the Army had done to Native people on bended knee, and which I think was pretty profound. A lot of young Native people I've heard from people on Standing Rock found a new sense of their own agency, voice, and value that they didn't have before. And my f one of my favorite things is this young bartender hopped in a station wagon with her friends in New York and headed out to Standing Rock, as a lot of us did. I was just there briefly to cover it for The Guardian. And um, what, sh what happened to her there was so profound and made her so hopeful. She came back to New York and, dis and s felt powerful in a way she had never had before, did this wild thing, ran for Congress against the third most powerful man in the Democratic Party in the lower house, and beat him. And none of you have ever heard of her before that. And her name is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And all of you have heard of her afterwards. And that's because, and she says it's because of Standing Rock. So, but I should also say Third Act, which is a, uh, Bill McKibben's new climate group for people over 60, which I'm on the advisory board of, is doing fantastic work, um, you know, and so um, thank you so much for bringing that up. And other questions? Or you just all agree with me and it all made perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that. But, uh, yeah. It's a talk about individualism versus collectivism and some of the other values in Not Too Late. One of the things that was really striking when Thelma and I had gathered these 20 essays and interviews from 20 amazing people around the world is over and over and over people talked about the necessity and value and importance of community, both for what we need to do the work to build the world we want and what we want to see in the world we want. And I don't think it has to be oppositional to individualism as in being quirky and private and doing your thing, but in terms of being disconnected and only considering your own well-being, which has been so much pushed. Wait, am I in Arizona? Do you have any libertarians here? <laughs> <laughs> um, has been such a kind of macho white American value. And the people also talked about love a lot. And I think they talked about patience a lot. And these are people actually doing the work and knowing it's not always fast, easy, predictable, et cetera. And it was such an honor to work with them all. So yeah, and so over and over, community and love. And something I think a huge misnomer about activism is people often think we're driven by anger. But I think that anger, or which can mean so many different things. It can actually mean hate or rage or adrenaline surges when somebody in a car almost runs you over on your bicycle, you know, or it can just mean righteous indignation. Is re that, and the, you know, and the righteous indignation side of things, I think is often really fueled by love. You, you hate the trees being cut down because you love the trees. You hate the fossil fuel, what the fossil fuel industry is doing, what, you know, carbon emissions are doing because you love the, love the earth, the planet, and want a decent future for people who are gonna live to see the 21st century. So I always feel, because there is a sense that we're all very angry as though the rest of America isn't, uh, and, um, you know, and, and you know, and I actually have spent, been blessed to be around a lot of long-term activists, and they're not really angry people. They're really generous-spirited people, and I think people who are kind of living, was well, my friend Roshi Joan Halifax, a Buddhist leader who's in the book, says, living by vow, living by their principles, by their beliefs, beliefs, living with great integrity. They often feel pretty, you know, harried and stressed out sometimes, but there's a kind of deeper satisfaction in having a meaningful life and defending what you love. So, yeah, and thank you. And that was an amazing question. Yeah. Hi, I have uh, two teenagers. Yeah. And that's the whole, and 
I'm, that's kind of the whole thrust of a lot too late in a way, which you know, um, um, yeah, or read it and talk to them about it. I, I didn't. What, I actually, one of the scientists in the book said that his teen, his eight, even being, you know, a top climate scientist can't protect his daughter entirely from all the rubbish about climate that makes a lot of young people feel despair, defeat, that they're doomed. Um, and I think they're right to feel like. They've gotten shafted. We should have done so much more to make a better future so much sooner. But I think, you know, it's also an incredibly exciting era. And so it's really, for me, about changing the whole story, reminding them how people have changed the world before, reminding them they're powerful, if they bind, band together, reminding them that a lot of people do care, reminding them that we have the solutions, that we know what to do, finding the stories from the past where people took on something like, in the you know the 19th century slavery, and I was actually because I've been on book tour. I was in Washington D.C. and there was a display in the Museum of American History that touched on these women in the 1830s who were part of the abolitionist movement, and they were like making pincushions and aprons to sell at little bazaars to raise money for speaking tours by people like Frederick Douglass. And I know that people were, must have been laughing at them then the way people laugh at activists now, like, you think you're gonna stop slavery with pincushions? And they were really, they were the avant-garde of a movement that ultimately ended slavery. So, and I feel like there's so many things that educate us in despair. There's a kind of selfishness and banality of the versions of human nature we get from a lot of pop culture and sitcoms, the encouragement to be selfish, to pursue pretty superficial things and be told, they make us happy when they don't. And to not hear the stories of how change really gets made, the power we have, the ways we've changed the world for the better so they live in a world where, I know I'm still in Arizona, about being queer, trans, female, non-white, um, you know, to be people with disabilities, et cetera, is really different than it was, you know, 50 years ago. You know, I think there are, the, you know, I've been making the case for hope for 20 years and hope in the dark and this book and a lot of other things. And it often boils down to us, the stories about human nature. And we're often told that we're selfish, petty, trivial, shallow human beings. It's part of why I really hated that Don't Look Up movie. It kind of blamed, you know, the banality of American citizens for the end of the world. And this polls show most people now care passionately about climate and want to see money expended and changes made. A lot of times people have outdated ideas about climate, things that used to be true. We didn't used to have the solutions. Um, we, didn't use, we didn't used to have the whole pub, the majority of the public with us, the huge majority, because it's really in like around 80% or more. And um, so I think all those, I think find all those things really encouraging. We actually have a website that answers a lot of basic questions and gives encouragement. Um, I'm kind of like too busy now, but we were doing social media almost daily with Not Too Late to just put out positive and hopeful climate stories. And But also, people feel powerless when they don't do anything. Often the powerful thing to do is to join something. There's probably a branch of the Sunrise Movement or Extinction Rebellion here, which are kind of much more youth-oriented and badass. There's a lot of other climate groups and things. And if they care about climate, um, there's always things that they can do. And there always will be. People think 1.5 is some kind of cliff, as one of the scientists in the book, Dr. Jacqueline Gill, said, a cliff we're going to fall off. Another story in the book is about how that um, sort of boundary was set by the climate vulnerable nations. It's a great story of David versus Goliath. People from the global south forced the nations of the world to set that standard in Paris in 2015. They, most people thought, oh, you'll never get them to agree to it. Be reasonable, we'll lose if we say 1.5 degrees. We gotta settle for two degrees. But they fought and they won. So it's not, a, even if we probably will overshoot to 1.5, it's not the end of anything. We actually even know how to reverse climate change if we, you know, long, it's difficult, it's not impossible if we sequester more carbon than we emit. And, um, and there will always be something worth fighting for. It will never, like, we will never stop having to address climate, you know, in this century and the next. But there will always be things that are beautiful, things that are valuable, things to love, things to care about, things worth defending. So, because there's never going to be a point at which it's all over. 
and oh my God, I'm feeling like, okay, that was probably almost too. I do meet young people who think like, and not so young people who think either civilization's gonna die out, humanity's gonna die out, or life on earth is gonna die out. And that's like, no, short version, no. Everything's changing, you know, we will lose species, we will lose places, things will be different, but I'm, I'm pretty confident human beings will be here in the 23rd century and that it behooves us to make it as good for them as possible in this decade. And with that, I should probably...